This is Epicenter, episode 330 with guest Jacob Arluck. Hey there, Sebastian here. You know, the podcaster listener relationship is too unbalanced. You know us a lot better than we know you, and we want to narrow that gap. So please do me a favor and answer our audience survey. It takes four minutes, and it will help us to continue producing content that informs and inspires you. You can find the survey at epicenter.rocks slash survey. And at the end, I'll tell you how you can get a free KeepKey hardware wallet, courtesy of Shapeshift, to thank you for your time. So thanks in advance, and on with the show. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Couture. Today, our guest is Jacob Arluck. Jacob is the founder of TQ Tezos. They're a company that works to advance the Tezos ecosystem by creating open source software and other public goods for Tezos. Now, Tezos is a project that I've not followed very closely. It's been over a year since we last did an episode about Tezos. This was when Arthur and Kathleen Brightman were on the podcast. It was a October of 2018, and I'm almost embarrassed to admit it, but that was really the last time I looked into it. So I was really pleased to do this interview with Sunny. I felt that it provided a really good overview of the Tezos ecosystem at the moment. You know, when we last did the interview with Arthur and Kathleen, this was right around the launch. There wasn't much of an ecosystem yet. And so you'll see that a lot has happened since then. And, you know, at some point, I think it would make sense for us to also have a conversation with the folks at Nomadic Labs, for instance, since they're, you know, right here in town. So anyway, here's what you'll learn. Uh, The decentralized nature of the Tezos development ecosystem, who's funding protocol development, the permissionless nature of the Tezos architecture and the governance system, how TQ is working to make Tezos more accessible, the impressive number of development languages in Tezos, there are at least seven major ones, and the kind of issues that creates around things like interoperability and composability. Mickelson, with the stack-based domain-specific language, and the shift towards Mickelson 2.0, the types of applications being built on Tezos, the role of the Tezos Foundation and what the Brightmans are up to today, and a look at Tezos governance two years in and what we can expect in the future. So as I'm recording this, ECC just wrapped up in Paris, and I spent most of the weekend sleeping. It was so exhausting, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, I mentioned here before, but we had our own podcast studio, which allowed me to pack in a bunch of interviews. I used that thing to its full potential. I recorded a bunch of long form content, but also some shorter interviews that we'll be putting out in the next couple of weeks. So we're still sorting through all that content, but you should see the first bonus episode show up in your podcast feed this week on Thursday, if all goes well. So this is a panel discussion that Frédérica and I did with Jérôme de Tichet of Ethereum France. They're the association, the nonprofit that put on the conference, Gonzalo Sal of Consensus Diligence, and Cassidy Daly of Centrifuge. So we talked about a lot of stuff, a lot of current event things that are happening in the DeFi ecosystem, like the whole flash loan episode that's been happening over the last few weeks. And we also talked about the state of Ethereum in these uncertain times, let's say. Anyway, I can't thank Pepo enough for helping us put this together, for being our partners in this podcast studio experiment. It wouldn't have been possible without them, and it's something that I definitely plan on doing again in the future, although right now it's uncertain if and when any conferences will take place this year. So hopefully things will come back to normal sooner than later. I also want to thank everybody who came to the meetup on Wednesday. One of the things that I love the most about doing this podcast is hanging out with our fans because our listeners are some of the nicest, coolest, and smartest people in the crypto ecosystem. I don't know how we managed to get all of you to listen to the podcast, but somehow you're all here. And every time I hang out with you guys and gals, I feel like I'm just hanging out with a bunch of friends and it's always so cool and I love it. So thanks for coming, and I look forward to seeing you at the next one. Before we go to the interview, I'd like to tell you about our sponsor for today's episode, the Nervous Ecosystem Grants Program. The Nervous blockchain went live recently, and they're funding innovative ideas and developments to the protocol. 
So if you're a developer or a project and you're seeking funding for your innovative idea, or if you're interested in making a significant contribution to building out the Nervos infrastructure, you should explore the Nervos Grants program because they have a total of $30 million in funding available. Now, you probably heard the interview we did with the founder of Nervos, Kevin Wang, in January, but Nervos is a proof-of-work blockchain with a unique layered architecture. It combines the security and simplicity of Bitcoin with the flexibility of Ethereum. So on layer one, you have the common knowledge base, which is reserved for security and store of value, while layer two is used for computation and scalability. So to connect with the team and learn more about the grants program, including how you can apply and the types of grants that are available, please go to nervos.org slash grants. And with that, here's our interview with Jacob Arluck. We're here today with Jacob Arluck. So Jacob, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, happy to be on. So please tell us a bit about your background, how you got involved in crypto and how you got involved with Tezos. Absolutely. So, um, so actually used to work um, in the biotech life sciences space. Um, and in 2018 or so, I was um, really even before that back in, you know, sort of 2016, I'd been sort of my interest was peaked again um, in, in the space. Um, actually, a lot of people get, you know, sort of get back, got back into the space after the lull of like 2014, 2015. Uh, because of, you know, sort of Ethereum, actually, for me, it was more that um, I was really interested in things like Zcash actually launching and some of these projects that had been like white papers back in like 2014. Cosmos actually was, you know, another, it's like sort of these things that were resurfacing, you know, that like there was actually code, there was actually, there were actually people, you know, working around these projects and that sort of thing. And then um, in early 2018, obviously, you know, there was, in late 2017, there was like a lot of the Tezos drama, there was um, you know, sort of a lot of, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, the project seemed like it was, it wasn't, um, Tezos was one of these projects as well that basically I was like, you know, had been following, you know, for obviously a really long time. I've always been really interested in like sort of coordination mechanisms personally and really interested in, um, you know, sort of the decentralized governance and these kinds of questions, like even back to like sort of undergrad and, and before. Tezos was just like actually coming out. I, I, I sort of thought it was a more academic approach to it originally. Like, I, And I also thought that originally like it wasn't something that, um, you know, would actually make practical sense. But um, then when I actually saw in 2016, like with the Dow fork and like a few other things that happened in, in, in that time, uh, then even in like all the rumblings around Bitcoin governance and that sort of thing, became very, very interested again in some of these ideas. And so uh, in early uh, 2018, um, sort of got connected to the um, the folks after the foundation mess had been resolved, sort of got connected um, to the project. And um, you know, sort of got involved around the launch in Paris, uh, which was, you know, in, in, you know, in June of 2018. But obviously from, um, you know, New York and, and um, basically, uh, you know, wanted to spin up an organization that was really the, the, the thing I realized was like there wasn't much um, focus around building these key public goods to establish an ecosystem. Like when you look at Ethereum, um, the reason it's been a huge success, in my opinion, in addition to like the fact that it's sort of really, you know, has a powerful ethos and developer culture and all this kind of stuff. Um, and also being the first like smart contract, real you know useful smart contract platform, um, it was also that they just had really invested in like you know robust public goods. You know that took many years for them to build, get to a state that could actually be used by major companies, by any random developer, or whatever. But the goal that we set out to is like if we're going to scale up, you know Tezos to be you know something that's you know global, that's widely used, et cetera, it's going to need to be able to um, you know sort of onboard all you know all these folks, and and there's going to need to be sustainability around how public goods are, are, you know, sort of maintained and managed. So down the road that led to, you know, sort of the creation of a lot of other, you know, a lot of other like sub projects here at TQ, but the founding ethos of the, of the company and of the project um, here that we're, you know, that we're working on is sort of around, um, you know, how do we can create the key necessary building blocks for people to, to build, um, you know, to, to feel like it's an ecosystem where they, they, they're comfortable to get started um, and build a business or build a, build an application or, um, you know, anything uh, on top of. What do you see as some of the most important public goods in the Ethereum ecosystem? Is it like some of the stuff that Consensus was building with like Truffle and MetaMask, or is it stuff from the EF? Like, what do you see as the most important ones? From the EF, it's definitely the EIP process itself, I think is like really underrated as a, as a driver of Ethereum success, but also like a lot of the focus on security auditing, a lot of the focus on around privacy research, like research, like a lot of like cutting edge stuff that a lot of people don't even realize. EF is, is sort of behind. Um, and then you have consensus uh, stuff, which is like really, I think, really underrated. Um, like people like to bash consensus for being, 
becoming very large and for you know trying to influence everything a lot of things in ethereum but the thing that they got right i think for sure is um or it's having things like infura and having things like truffle having things like metamat like those are like without those things having a long term sustainable you know sort of funding source ethereum because it's going to be pretty impossible to um to to maintain uh, its uh, its lead i think but it's it's not just that it's that when you go to another ecosystem like if you're even giving up one of these public goods <laughs> you're like i don't want to go there <laughs> so the one of the things we hear constantly is like Where's the Tezos version of MetaMask? You know, we have things like Infura on Tezos already. We have things like with Truffle. Literally, we work with Truffle. They're they're launching on Tezos um, support in March. Now the thing is like, well, where's MetaMask? I want to build an application, but there's no, Meta, you know, there's nothing like MetaMask. And so, um, basically, figuring out how to make sure that we have all those key key public goods that they're, and then also down the road, the, the idea is to build decentralized processes and other uh, mechanisms for identifying gaps and funding them, and then and also um, properly managing them. And you can get into like sort of how we think about how to tackle all these different, you know, sort of parallel but connected problems. But that's sort of the way we come at it. It's like right now let's get up to speed. Let's catch up to Ethereum. Let's compress the like two years of Ethereum. Things like open Zeppelin, all these things. It took a while to develop, right? But it like when you go to Ethereum, it's as if like those things have already always been there. <laughs> if we could jump that if we could skip the line, so to speak, and just get a lot of these public goods. And I think if you look at other new projects, Cosmos is a great example. A lot of the focus is on like what are the other things that you can pull out of the box to compose with your with your custom chain or, or whatever, right? So Polkadot's doing that, Cosmos is doing that, um, you know, folks like Cello are doing that, and I think that that's going to be like what what uh, really uh, drives like adoption, or rather, that's what's going to when people talk about like what do ETH killers look like or what will start pulling people through the funnel away from Ethereum or off of Ethereum. It's going to be things like that. At a minimum, that's what you need to have in order to to do so. Cool. We'll jump into talking about some of the public goods that you guys are kind of working on directly in a, in a minute. But before we do that, could you tell us a little bit about the name of the company, TQ Tezos? Because, you know, when I first learned about the story, I was like, oh, my God, this is the perfect name. I love this name. By the way, when I first heard it, I accidentally misthought it stood for Tezos Quorum. Which is our conference series, which is like our main conference yeah. series. Yeah, which is the, Tezos, the main Tezos conference series. Um, and we obviously, um, you know, play a big role in that as well. The head of TQ, uh, Alison uh, Manjaro, she she's actually a political scientist by training. We were basically like thinking like what would be cool, some cool things to name you know names for 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 this organization. And um, the original one that we wanted was uh, that we talked about a lot was Voltaire. So Voltaire was one that I was really excited for. And then we were like, well, wait, we should probably you know these are a bunch of dead white guys. We should probably go back and make sure that they you know see what some of their positions were and see what they did anything that would like scar a company down the road. You know. And so I went up and looked up, looked up Voltaire. He had a lot of views that were not in line with current thinking. <laughs> and I'm sure, to, you know, uh, to, the Tocqueville did as well, but his were pretty egregious, like some really, some really things. So we're like, well, let's think of another one. Um, and they're like, well, what about Alexis de Tocqueville? And we're like, well, wait, you know, Tezos obviously has its origins in France. And now we have, you know, this, this entity here in the U.S. Well, they're not, not entirely in the U.S., but, you know, in, you know mostly you know, in, in the U.S. And what if we named it after the Tocqueville? And we're like, well... That's fine, but like when people hear Tocqueville, they think of like marijuana or something, like you know, toking or something. We've literally heard people say like, "Why do you call it that?" Like whatever. I'm like so, let's come up with an abbreviation that's really catchy and really easy to say and, and whatever. And it came with came up with TQ, and so then that stuck. So everyone just refers to us as TQ. Can you just give a brief un, uh, explanation of what Tocqueville did? Like, what was his main body of work? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the other thing, right? It's like so, as I said, like he he was like a you know basically. A, what he did was like mostly like precursor to um to like what what people call political science now. We used to call it political economy back in the day. That's what my minor was in. Oh yeah, nice, nice. He uh basically wrote this book called Democracy in America, where he sort of went up close and really and analyzed like how the American psyche and American like sort of social norms and things sort of differ from his homeland in France or just Europeans in general. And a lot of it is around um like the relationship between notions of like how how folks interact with authority, how folks um, you know sort of think about power and things like that, and 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 those are all topics that we're super interested in, and and, and part of the inspiration. Things like agora, things like the Tezos governance process in general. Like we're really interested in like what are the institutions that internet native institutions that we need to create around uh, you know the Tezos ecosystem, you know, to um, to really make sure that it you know sort of fulfills its its like sort of long term long term goals and mission. There's lots of, lots of uh, parallels to uh, to that, yeah, for sure. So give us a sense of who the major players are in the Tezos ecosystem and 
how they interact. You know, if, if someone was coming at this for the first time and wanted a sort of, you know, mapping of the Tezos ecosystem, what would they see? So I think the, the place to start is like, you obviously have, you know, the main architects and creators of Tezos, in, in, you know, most of whom sit in Paris um, at Nomadic Labs. And Nomadic Labs, you know, one way to think of it is it's sort of like parody for Polkadot, you know, or I don't know, Tendermint team in Cosmos or, you know, one of the, or whatever, All in Bits rather in Cosmos, or one of these just sort of founding teams that created the protocol and thus like has an obvious role as, steward, you know, in some capacity stewards of, of, of the network or feel some responsibility for, for, you know, improving it and whatnot. But the nature of Tezos, and we can get into this, is just, you know, obviously it has this multi-stage on-chain governance mechanism. And so in practice, there's no canonical core dev team. There's no canonical group that is the steward of the chain or whatever. But, um, you know, obviously in practice, you know, these things tend to fall back to, you know, a team that, you know, <laughs> given that Tezos is written on OCaml, there's very few OCaml devs in the world. Um, it's not surprising, right, that these folks are the main stewards of the, you know, of the core, um, of the shell, all these, of the protocol, of the shell, etc. And then you also have, um, you know, other sort of like core dev teams that are contributing um, to a lesser extent, but obviously still important. So you have folks like Cryptium Labs um, in, uh, who are based in Switzerland. They're both a validator as well as a, they work on um, core amendment, you know, core um, protocol amendment proposals and things like that. Um, and then you also have folks like uh, Dilambda, which is like a company in a small company in um, uh, in Japan that's also um, you know part of part of this process. We actually have a couple um, protocol devs here in, in New York, uh, and including a member of the the merge team, and that's uh, someone on our team who contributes to to core development as well. Um, so that's sort of how core core shakes out. Then above that, you have different language teams. So you have uh, things like Ligo, um, and Ligo is a um, a language that compiles down to Mickelson, which is the Tezos, um, you know, sort of uh, smart contract um, ESL. Then you have like teams like SmartPy. You have teams like, and then there's others like Archetype and and uh, SCaml and and Alper. And like there's, there's sort of these teams that are working on uh, some of those angles. Then you have folks who are doing sort of like some of the layer two projects. And there's folks like you know there's a couple of them. You know, one of them is in in um, in Japan. You know, called Crypto Economics Lab. I think they also developed a thing on Ethereum called Plasma Chamber. They're doing a lot of work around uh, optimistic rollups and OVM stuff on Tezos. And then you have, you know, obviously entities like ours, you have entities like the Tesla Commons Foundation as well, which is like sort of a community organization. We collaborate a lot with them, uh, particularly on things like Tesla Segura, which we can get into um, later, as well as other um, projects like LabNet and other Tezos projects that are really focused on fostering an open, you know, decentralized, you know, governance process. And then you have um, these sort of these, there's all these other entities around the world that are working on Tezos uh, adoption or Tezos, you know, projects like so there's uh, teams in, uh, you know, in Brazil, there's a team in, in Brazil, there's a team in Israel, there's a team in Ukraine, there's a team in Japan, there's Tezos in Korea, there's Tezos in Southeast Asia, there's Tezos China in, in Hong Kong. Um, and all of these actually have full-time folks working on um, Tezos projects or working towards Tezos um, in some way. But, uh, but all in all, yeah, there, I, I'd say that that's sort of the, the, the basic um, lay of the land. And then, of course, you have the Tezos Foundation, which is, um, you know, sort of serving as an endowment you know, that basically funds, you know, some portion of ecosystem activity. They're sort of also, you know, sort of help, uh, you know, sort of can be coordination in some capacities. They, you know, sort of undertake strategic projects. They'll talk to folks who want to build something uh, on Tezos. They'll talk to folks who are thinking about like doing equity investments in people, you know, building something on Tezos, um, stuff like that. Um, so the, a lot of what their role is, is more as like a, a funding source for parts of, you know, certain parts of the ecosystem you know obviously we work with them pretty closely um especially around the you know public goods around things like Tesla's, the Tesla's conference series even from describing it this way it's probably um still a little confusing the basic way that this thing is designed is is, is, is so that like yeah you basically have representation of tezos in all of these key geographies around the world um pretty much every continent you know other than uh maybe australia and uh, antarctica probably has some kind of meaningful full-time tezos presence at this point there's, you know, basically a lot of effort going forward to figure out how to, what other entities should be spun up, what other types of uh, funding vehicles should we spin up for things like ecosystem public goods and, and, and other matters. There's a lot of very decentralized development going on. How do you like coordinate this? And like, are there ever any situations where this comes into an issue? For us, actually, at Cosmos, you know, we're kind of going through this process right now as we speak of like decentralizing our development. So it's like get some learnings from a team that project that already is in that pro has done that. 
there's a few areas actually where I think there's a lot to to learn. So I think the first one is, um, you know, it's obviously a big question around who's funding um, protocol dev, who's capable of doing protocol dev, what's the barrier to entry, those sorts of things. Around Tezos, the the barrier to entry that's sort of from the beginning has always been around OCaml, right? And as well as just functional programming in general. So functional programmers just kind of think differently than, you know, traditional developers. They write code that has to be maintained probably by other functional programmers. In Tezos' case, um, a lot of the opportunity for decentralizing protocol dev, you know, at the protocol core level seems to be the biggest opportunities around trying to, you know, sort of refactor the code base or build tools and documentation about parts of the code base that are poorly documented so that folks can very easily uh, get started. Understanding that there's probably the smaller subset of the total devs in the world who can actually ever contribute to Tezos, but at least we can capture a larger share of them. And, and in practice, one of the analogies that I always use for blockchain broadly is that when people always talk about how WhatsApp sold to Facebook for $19 billion and had something like 15 employees, some days a set of blockchains could run, you know, trillions of dollars in, in global uh, GDP, but only be supported by a small number of devs relative to that, right? You could have maybe it's even a thousand developers who, um, you know, basically support software that powers, you know, trillions and trillions of dollars of value. We don't need to get the number up that much. We don't need to, you know, build that, you know, get that many folks doing core dev. It's more so a matter of just getting it, even doubling, for example, what we have today, or the accessibility doubling what we have today would make a huge difference. And then you look at Ethereum, right, where, where there's a lot, it's a lot more accessible to get into core development, but the roadmap is so complex <laughs> so that there's sort of a different kind of barrier to entry, which is around, you know, who can possibly build a sharded, you know, proof of stake, highly scalable, uh, you know, blockchain infrastructure. So that barrier to entry is, is a really big one. And there's not a lot of folks who, for example, know there's a very small number of folks who can even work on zero knowledge. There's a very small number of folks who can work on doing sharding and cross-chain uh, interaction and light clients, all this kind of stuff. And where I think it'll all go uh, in the long run um, sort of stems from, you know, basically what are the incentives to improve the core? Tezos has, and Cosmos as well, have, you know, sort of on-chain funding mechanisms, right, to incentivize core development. It hasn't really been used yet in Tezos, um, you know, the way that sort of folks love to to talk about. So there's a lot of hype and discussion around, you know, sort of using this concept of the invoice in Tezos, which is basically where you can attach a one-time or a recurring reward for proposal that you submitted to improve the protocol. And this can all be done on-chain, fully on-chain uh, in Tezos, um, whereas in other networks, uh, you need to, maybe there's a treasury and people need to vote on it. And then the development happens, you know, sort of off proposal happens, uh, the, the execution of the amendment proposal happens totally off-chain. You know, I think in Cosmos, right, you guys don't do automatic upgrade. I mean, you're moving towards doing automatic upgrades down the road, but you vote on a, a proposal and then someone goes and implements it and then it gets, you know, you hard fork to adopt it, right? In Tezos, it doesn't work that way. The architecture is inherently more uh, permissionless. That said, there is probably more barriers to entry around who can actually work on this thing, as well as given the unique skill set that's needed, you know, getting funding, getting up to speed, and then also thinking that your amendment even has a chance of making it. You know, it's very hard to say right now in any of these networks, if I start, you know, very smart, there's, you have a really capable team and they sort of say, we want to submit these changes to the core. Do they actually have a sense of what the expected chances of success are? And so that's one of the things that we're really interested in, especially where we want to take Agora is uh, basically creating a lot more legibility around what are the needs of the project especially at the core level, and then creating an open permissionless prioritization systems like using, for example, prediction markets or in combined with signaling. So if you think of sort of some of the ideas that were, have been put forth by Dow Stack, there's a lot of interesting sort of mechanism design ideas for, I think, for basically using that to something like holographic consensus or some derivative of that to prioritize potential protocol amendments and thus justify decentralized funding of those things. So that's one of the areas where we definitely are interested in taking it. If a project can sort of get to a point where they can do decentralized open source development of one of these core protocols, turn of phrase that I use is if you can get teams that hate each other potentially to work around the same coordination mechanism, you know you have a good mechanism. Like that's like a base layer expectation for an institution is whether or not it can coordinate and manage like sort of competing priorities and people who don't like each other.
one experiment that's really worth making is probably around making the needs of the platform legible in some way, even if it's just in a limited area at first, then trying to build mechanisms that can help inform prioritization of those things. And this would all be off-chain, by the way, for now. I mean, parts of it would be executed. Do you have teams in the Tezos core development community that hate each other? I don't think so, no. I think there's obviously tensions between, you know, sort of core and there's inherent tensions between the different stakeholders of the ecosystem. So, you know, you have bakers who have one set of incentives, you have token holders who have one set of incentives, you have smart contract developers and enterprises, you have uh, core teams and folks who are really interested in functional programming. Balancing those different priorities is really important. And, and in order to do that, you need to have a mechanism for making legible concrete needs and then fostering discussions and then enabling prioritization of those. In all politics, all institutions, you end up with agenda setting as more important than the actual vote, right? So in like the US Congress, in most parliamentary systems, the outcome of most elections and most most decision-making processes is pretty well known well ahead of time. And that's because most of the game is not around the actual vote. It's around what even gets put up to a vote. Obviously, that's set on based on like sort of who has control, who has, you know, the most votes in this thing, but where it all eventually plays out is in is in the agenda setting component of the process. And so that's what we're thinking a lot about now and how to improve that so that you can introduce some of the permissionlessness and openness that you have of the on-chain system off-chain, to summarize it that way. And that way to, you know, sort of just bring it more into harmony with the expectations of all the stakeholders of the system and then prioritize those expectations uh, accordingly permissionless nature of the architecture. So we think of blockchains as like permissionless application platforms, right? I think it's the first time that I've heard someone use that term to define and characterize the development and the evolution of that blockchain itself. And I think like that's one of the things that characterizes Tezos is the permissionless nature of how the protocol evolves through the on-chain governance system. That's an interesting thing to think about. It's just like the idea of like building an autonomous internet native infrastructure institution. It's like and there's lots of folks in, in, in other ecosystems like, you know, Vlad or whomever who will get scared, you know, start shaming you for using this framing. But I think that's where the Tezos is really aiming to be is trying to become some kind of, I mean, I think it already is all well on its way, but the long-term goal is to try to become a fully autonomous organism or whatever you want to call it that basically can power, you know, obviously all the sorts of crypto native and internet native institution use case. So that whether that's asset settlement, whether that's DAOs, internet native you know, organizations, those sorts of things power items inside of games in an autonomous, like, you know, you could imagine in-game economies that are totally autonomous. And in terms of the scale at which you can have a, you know, you can run an MMORGG, for example, that has, yet mediates economic value or something like that. Like, that's what you hope these kinds of architectures make possible. Generally, we're just trying to introduce a lot of these, if you think of the process right now as, you know, sort of a lot of soft, you know, and normal human processes also involve GitLab and, and, and whatnot that then lead to this permissionless and hard on-chain process. Imagine that with, where we think a lot of this is going to probably go over time is, at least in our, our team at, you know, at TQ or the, you know, in some of our conversations with other stakeholders in the ecosystem is towards widening along that journey, like moving the permissionlessness a little bit outward and more into the agenda setting part as well. Tell us what TQ focuses on specifically then. One of the main areas where we focus on to date is um, really around smart contract development and standards, as well as like working with some of the key language, pro like the new smart contract language projects that are, you know, make Tezos development a lot more accessible, as well as working with folks like, uh, you know, Truffle Suite and um, you know, sort of some of the well-established development platforms for Ethereum. We also work with uh, companies that are building on Tezos. And basically, you know, so sort of a lot of that is around tokenization and digital securities. And there's a host of other use cases that we haven't yet communicated on. But a lot of the, the thinking in our team is how do you build this kind of ecosystem around Tezos given, uh, you know, sort of its starting point, which was sort of with, you know, it launched, it had obviously Mickelson in a very, the joke is like a very low gas limit, a very, it just wasn't really built for public consumption, you know, initially. And you sort of didn't have really good tooling. There was, you know, lack of testing infrastructure. There's lack of, basically what you lacked was a feedback loop around people who would want to use the platform. So basically what you have is no users, no feedback about the languages and the tools and all these things, and thus no users as a result of that too. It's like a, a death spiral of lack of, of use, right? And so what's happened since, and, and this is really a testament to like all these different teams that are working like their butts off to make Tezos more accessible, 
that's why we ended up with so many language projects. But where we've come in a lot of times is, you know, we'll find an area, for example, and an obvious one is around like, say, token standards and stuff like that, where we're thinking, well, basically, you have all these people who want to build stuff on Tezos, but they don't want to have to build their own, you know, token standard, they don't want to have to build their own JavaScript library, like a web three, like when they're coming from another ecosystem, they have to then worry about whether or not they have these public goods that they had that they, they would otherwise have in Ethereum. Basically trying to foster the creation of a lot of those. So we initially created something very similar to ERC-20. And that's what we've used in you know, a lot of the ecosystem uses for, um, obviously, it's you know, different tokenization projects. But since then, we've been working for many months on thinking about how to build sort of a better token architecture, like more treating the token standard as more of a almost like a platform for people to invent other kinds of token types and, and token-based applications without being constrained by, for example, one particular token architecture. So, you know, obviously in Ethereum, you have the success of ERC-20, ERC-721. And then, you know, obviously folks have tried to foster some other more, if you look in EIP, the EIP repos, like, you know, you'll find just so many different failed standards and, and whatnot. And instead, our government is like, when you find that ERC-721 and ERC-20 don't work for you, like you don't have to even worry about a lot of the base, like transfer semantic or a lot of the base, um, some of the, like how you connect to permissioning around your token. And instead you can focus on build it, creating some kind of token type or finding some kind of token type that um, will thus, it'll already be supported in wallets, but you can customize it. Like a lot of the behavior of, of that token. Those are the kinds of projects that we're undertaking. We also work on more meta of all of this with the Tales Commons Foundation. We've created this um, platform for discussions as well as governance visualization and other, that's what it initially is, is like sort of a governance explorer plus a discussion forum, sort of like, that's very similar to ETH research in practice. And basically that was created to discuss protocol amendments, discuss changes uh, that are coming to the platform, as well as, you know, speculative ideas and, and trying to, build, you know, sort of foster the community around research and development, as well as making easier for folks like bakers and smart contract developers to understand and discuss like some of the the changes that are coming down the road. So we built that that Tesla Agora platform over last summer and launched it in the fall of last year, and it's been uh, really instrumental. I you know we think in in um, fostering discussions around some of the controversial amendment proposals that have emerged in recent memory. So there was this this amendment called Babylon, for example. It was sort of this really big test of the amendment process because there was a bug discovered in it halfway through. I always think of I, the joke that I make is that it was a much smaller version of something like the DAO hack in Ethereum, where you just get to this point and now we're like, well, you know, we have to make this decision. Like there's pros and cons of either one. And it's more so about making the decision in a way that has a high degree of social consensus and moving on rather than about like the exact details of that thing. And so Agora was really important uh, in around mediating a discussion, a really, really high quality, shockingly high quality for people on the internet discussion around that particular dilemma that was facing the community. That's one area. I guess we'll come back to the governance stuff in a second, but I'd like to focus, start off by uh, one of the first products that you mentioned, which is sort of this coordinating of these different language teams. One of the jokes I had about Tezos like ecosystem is that there's more languages being developed than actual applications. You know, obviously that's maybe a joke. There's probably are some applications being built as well. Every team that's working on in Tezos is developing their own language. And so why is this happening? And how does this affect sort of the composability of applications in the Tezos ecosystem? It affects it a lot. Yeah. So basically, it's kind of a joke about functional programmers is that they sort of are into these kinds of projects because they're really into, uh, you know, sort of programming language theory and, and that sort of thing. It's definitely true in our ecosystem. So there's a lot of folks who just have opinionated views about and just enjoy the art of creating uh, or the science of creating uh, programming languages. And no programming language on Tezos out of the gate was widely usable enough that it would gain the kind of network effect that Solidity has. One quick question here. How many languages are there? So there's Lego, SmartPy, Archetype. There's a, all the Haskell flavors. So that's like Morley, Lorenz, and Indigo. So that, consider that one. So that's four. Then you have the Juvix project from Cryptium Labs and Christopher Goes. And then you have uh, S Camel, which is a you know, Camel compiler to Mickelson. And then you also have Albert. And Albert is uh, like basically a intermediate representation, I believe, for 
that basically makes Mickelson a lot more readable. But yeah, so you're talking, let's see, two, three, four, five. At least 10. Six, like seven. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's seven like meaningful ones. Yeah, for sure. There were also some older ones like liquidity and fee, which nobody uses anymore, but we're obviously in the early days, that's what was around. In practice, we would argue that there's probably three of these that are getting any kind of use. So Lego, SmartPy, and the Haskell ones are the only ones that are getting significant use. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some folks who try archetype offers, like some formal verification tooling. And then you have um, Albert and, and also just Mickelson itself, which you know also offer a bunch of formal verification tooling where there, maybe there will be a few things written in these. But there's a lot of languages, and that's because of, I think it's mostly a cultural thing and the nature of these languages sort of taking a while to become fully useful the way that like Solidity is in, in Ethereum. The bigger problem is interop between all these languages. So in Ethereum, you have things like the API or you have like, you know, sort of people are you know, defining contract interactions and sort of in a, in a harder way. This doesn't exist in Tezos right now. And so uh, one of the challenges is that, yeah, there's interop requires between some of these languages can require, uh, you know, people, whatever it's called, glue code or whatever, you know, to basically a dongle <laughs> between uh, applications written in, in different languages. I don't think this is as big of a problem as people think. So in practice, probably there will be a power law around two of these. And then it's just a matter of probably trying to create some kind of something akin to an, the ABI in Ethereum. And so I've heard on a recent Telesagora thread, there was discussion about basically turning Mickelson into a lingua franca for all of these different languages. So creating really clearly defined interaction, basically clearly specifying an underlying semantic or whatever by interface by which these different contracts in these different languages can interface with each other. So we've mentioned Mickelson a couple of times. What is Mickelson? So basically it's this stack-based language that Tezos contracts compiled. It's like a DSL that interpreted to OCaml that basically people can you know write these. In theory, you can write it your by hand yourself um, and write a contract in it. But the best analogy to give is probably that it's like it's like a very imagine if the EVM was like a bit more readable. You had this stack based uh, language that people were, you know, could basically uh, write contracts in. And then um, basically in practice, what it has become is a, a compilation target for all these different uh, new languages that have come out. So Lego and SmartPy and Archetype and all these things, most of them just compile down to. Sort of like the EVM bytecode. Like there are some people who will go ahead and handwrite EVM bytecode, but I'm not sure people want to do that. And so it's the same thing with Michelson. I've also heard some like discussion around a shift from Michelson to Michelson 2.0, whatever that might be. Could you tell me a little bit what that is about? So I think that's still shaping out. There's basically a desire to definitely move towards something that's better serves as an intermediate representation so that people can basically compile these higher, like if all of the contracts are going to end up in these higher level languages, which we all sort of expect that you want to build something that's just a better intermediate representation. And then you can build had compilers, you can build all sorts of good, um, you know, better tooling and formal verification tools around across these different languages. Right now, there's been a lot of effort expended on this library called Mishokok. So it's a Kok representation of Mickelson. There's contracts that have been written in Mickelson and then specified in Kok and for, you know, with people proving properties in Kok of Mickelson contracts. The idea is to make it, I think, a better target for, you know, certified compilation as well as generalized form of verification across all these, on some of these other languages. And then there's also, um, if you go on Tales Agora, you'll, you can find a few articles by a guy named Sanders Spies, and he has a, an OCaml implementation of Wasm. And so uh, there's a lot of discussion there. That's probably more speculative and, and wow. take a while. And it won't be, I think, Wasm as you see it in whatever, Polkadot or does near use you know, Wasm, one of these other, some of these other projects that sort of are Wasm from the start, uh, it'll probably be some kind of subset or some kind of other flavor of Wasm, uh, as I understand it. So you can read about that on Telsagora. Um, some of the immediate features, though, that people want to add to Mickelson is definitely around readability. It's definitely about intermediate representations, et cetera. But it's also about adding things like events and the things that are really widely used in Ethereum that don't exist today in Tezos because the project was sort of launched without some of these very useful features, things that people who are doing integrations or tooling or wallets uh, definitely want to use. So we talked a bit about the you know languages side of my joke. Let's talk a little bit about the application side. What are some of the sort of applications that are currently being built on Tezos? 
I would break it down into a few categories. Um, so you have sort of folks who are doing DeFi-ish things. Uh, and so you have things like StakerDAO. It's a DAO that where folks sort of hold a buy a security token and then can manage, govern a this basket of, of tokens. Uh, initially, they're doing one, I think, that represents a bunch of staking assets. And then later, I think they're going to try it. Basically, the way, the way I explain StakerDAO is it's kind of like, you can think of it like MakerDAO, but instead of just doing a stable coin, they want to do, their idea is let's do lots and lots of different DeFi applications that we govern through this DAO. But the governance token from the start is a security. They're like, let's go bigger and also we'll constrain the set of of holders to this thing. That's actually more, creating that kind of clarity around onboarding for like institutional type folks, I think is actually underrated. I think that's that project's really interesting. They're using actually a lot of the stuff that we've built here at TQ and other parts of the ecosystem. So they're actually, they have a fork of Tezos Agora that people are going to, so imagine if MakerDAO governance decisions were mediated in part through something like Tezos Agora. That's basically what they're doing. And then they obviously use our you know, sort of reference implementations and, and token interfaces and things. So that's one uh, interesting project. Then there's a bunch of other folks uh, doing digital securities offerings or other kinds of digital securities projects on Tezos. And so there's a lot of work with these folks in, in Brazil who are like one of this very large investment bank that have been doing, they tokenize um, Brazilian uh, REITs and uh, this is a BTG Pactual. Uh, and then you have, um, you know, so a few other digital securities projects like the Elevated Returns Project in based out of uh, Thailand. By Elev- They're basically also tokenizing some REITs, uh, Thai REITs. There's also this uh, digital securities projects all around the world uh, doing, there's folks who I think tokenizing artwork in Korea. Then you also have sort of other flavors of projects, uh, you know, going back to the DeFi topic around one idea that's been open source uh, stablecoin design uh, that uh, Arthur Brightman, that one of the founders of Tezos has put forward is, is this idea of Checker, which is like kind of inspired by stablecoins and MakerDAO and things like this, I think has some distinctions. And he's really, I think, more interested in, we'll see where that one goes. But I think that's definitely something to look out for. There's also basically something very similar to Uniswap coming out pretty soon. I think that they're sort of figuring out their last steps and trying to get get us a smart contract audit, but that'll be coming out uh, soon enough. You have sort of the underpinnings of a DeFi ecosystem, for sure. You have sort of, you know, the uh, a couple assets that uh, folks are bringing to market, some not. I think you'll hear, hear about some of these um, interesting ones soon. And then you'll have, you know, sort of the stablecoin that are, that are being considered. And then you'll have, uh, you know, also uh, obviously this, you know, swap style uh, DEX. After all that, you can start to get into things like lending or, you know, so th- th- things like compound, uh, you know, that um, once you have sort of the basis for on-chain activity, uh, especially in the DeFi space, then you base DeFi primitives or whatever, then you sort of can extend to some of these other other areas. You mentioned digital securities and that there were quite a few projects building these types of applications on Tezos. Can you give us a sense of why that is? Why do you think that there are so many of these being built here? So I'd actually back up and say, why do people want to tokenize securities on blockchains at all? So this is like a, a thing of people, a lot of people in the blockchain space are like very mystified by. So that's not sexy. That's not, you know, interesting. You know, it works fine, et cetera. So, you know, the idea that we're, we've been looking at is that actually a lot of the, uh, the value prop for, say, doing this on a blockchain at all is that you can get a common infrastructure for the way assets are represented, both in trusted and, you know, sort of lower trust environments uh, that scales globally. So imagine that you could basically take off the shelf software that represents, uh, you know, sort of any kind of asset for any, you know, asset related use case uh, for anywhere in the world that, that follows the same standards on the same pl- on, on a common platform and basically drives the cost of this financial infrastructure down to zero. And so even if there's like, you know, the regulatory restrictions, um, even if there are, you know, sort of obviously still moats around exchange and things like that uh, and liquidity, you've just driven the friction to getting started. Like, like it's no longer around the software infrastructure. Like the software infrastructure now costs zero dollars. There's a lot of long-term benefits and innovations that can probably come out of folks onboarding all of these different types of all sorts of assets using common standards all around the world. And you can think of, for example, some kind of more interconnected global markets because all these assets are standardized. And even if there's like obviously lots of you know regulatory um, restrictions that are needed for um, how you ensure that people are following the appropriate local regulations and things like that, um, that this is the the foundation for building interconnected global economic uh, you know infrastructure. Um, and so if you take that long view, 
then you realize, you know, and that that's sort of the approach of, you know, sort of the, eco, you know, the entities in the Tesla ecosystem. That's that you realize that's definitely an area where we, where we kind of want to want to participate. And so we've directed a lot of, um, you know, effort towards uh, onboarding projects that want to uh, want to basically uh, eventually be on one big common uh, economic infrastructure. Uh, and then the value prop for Tezos specifically is that it's designed with few of the scary things about existing blockchains Tezos sort of tries to solve. So, uh, so for example, uh, obviously security of the underlying smart contracts and things like that, that's like a core tenant of Tezos. And obviously since Tezos was first introduced, there's been a huge amount of focus on formal verification across a lot of other ecosystems, um, especially in response to hacks on Ethereum, et cetera. But Tezos is really has, you know, both that security component and then also, you know, the focus on trying to have, um, you know, smart contracts that are very, very correct and very, you know, correctly, uh, you know, sort of specified and defined and, and have pr properties about them in mathematical, um, you know, form. You also have the governance aspect where basically if you want to tokenize something and you want to, you have this life cycle over, 20, 30 years, how do you know what platform is going to be around in 20, 30 years? Well, the argument is that something like Tezos has this governance mechanism so that it stays, you know, both maintains a social consensus over, um, you know, a very long time horizon, and, and as well as, you know, the ability to add features uh, to, to the protocol over time as new innovations become available. So the, the idea there is that imagine your, you know, your contract remains secure on this network, but you're getting access to this self-improving economic infrastructure that's becoming faster, it's becoming more secure, it's becoming battle tested, it's becoming, it's adding uh, functionality that, you know, it starts to accumulate all these network effects, you know, that, that are driven fundamentally by the improvement on the underlying infrastructure, but while maintaining the security and safety of your assets on that platform. And so that's very theoretical, but in practice, I think like, I think it's designed with some of these kinds of, like, how do you make these kinds of theoretical advantages tangible and that's sort of some of the stuff that we're really interested in working on it's like you know the self-improving economic infrastructure that people can tokenize their assets on safely and know that over 30 years their the, the infrastructure will continue to improve but that their assets are in, in their their applications are secure there's sort of a long-term vision here about the longevity of tezos given the on-chain governance given this sort of self-amending property of tezos that is somehow attractive to people who want to build financial infrastructure that will outlast, uh, let's say, the whims of uh, those developing the project or you know the, the ecosystem or this sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Okay, interesting. So it's like autonomous uh, base layer financial infrastructure for everyone in the world that improves and uh, continues to, but but it itself improves uh, obviously conservatively because. Of the way the governance mechanism is designed, but while maintaining the security of the applications and and uh, assets that are on top. So I wanted to ask you then, because you mentioned Arthur, and I think he plays a role uh, in the ecosystem in terms of pushing ideas and doing research. And what is his role now? And I think more broadly, you know, what is the role of the foundation as well? Kathleen as well. I mean, because those are sort of two pillars, I guess, in the Tezos ecosystem that can't be overlooked. Absolutely. So Arthur definitely provides a lot of, uh, I think, a lot of inspiration to the folks that are building on Tezos and as well as the core development team. So I think he contributes to the types of things that are developed at teams like Nomadic Labs or evaluate some of these ideas or even write prototypes of different ideas that he has and then hand them off and if they're interesting, you know, or, or, or valuable, someone will try to advance them through the process. So if you go on Telsagora again, you'll find a lot of his a lot of his blog posts about different ideas that he's considering. One of those is like this idea of like contract signatures, or you can find him talking about like, you know, different topics around delegation and staking and how he would improve the Tesla staking model. Or I think he was a contributor to the upgrade of the Tesla consensus algorithm back in the Babylon upgrade. Most of his involvement is definitely around uh, some of those areas, for sure. And then obviously Kathleen, she's, uh, you know, she has a gaming company um, called Coase. Uh, building on top of Tezos, they uh, you know, are doing, I think, Magic the Gathering on, on Tezos. Um, really, you know, folks have a lot of experience in the gaming space. Um, and they're you know, sort of doing trading card game based on, on, on Tezos. Uh, 
Uh, and then you have um, going, going to the question on the foundation. The foundation's role is, uh, you know, at least that's it's set out for itself, is that it's a member of the community that funds key infrastructure and public good projects. It's a different role than actually the Ethereum. I think the Ethereum Foundation plays, where you know the the, the Tails Foundation does not control anything like an EIP process, where you know or anything. And I'm not saying that Ethereum Foundation 100% controls the EIP process either. I don't. I don't. I think that's an unfair thing to say. But the arc, the way that it's set up in Ethereum is such that core development, as well as standards and all these things, they kind of do flow through through the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, and uh, there's a very explicit role for both the founder of, of Ethereum and the, the Ethereum Foundation to just kind of stick around for a long time and, and just sort of guide things quietly. Uh, the Tails Foundation is much more of a sort of a caretaker foundation where it's participating, but it's not governing or managing the network by any means. It's really more so of a, an organization that's funding key projects and then uh, basically uh, making sure that the money as well is not spent on bad activities. <laughs> and so what areas is the foundation funding at the moment and what are some of the key things that the foundation wants to focus on? Yeah, sure. So the Tales Foundation, I, I, you know, and, and I'm, I'm involved with a, a few of their committees and a few of their internal decision-making processes. And basically, you know, I, what I can say is that essentially the, a lot of the focus is on building, as I say, like a lot of this key infrastructure from bottom to top that enables the, you know, sort of the vision that I described. So the notion of this thing as currency and also as financial infrastructure, what are the things that we need to build? So, and what are the things that need to get funded? So things like wallets, things like projects that, you know, do, doing, um, you know, basically going out and finding folks who want to tokenize something interesting on, on Tezos and getting them to understand the, the, the value prop and then, you know, providing them also direction towards some of the uh, tools and, and other public goods that are, that are available for them to, to get started. Uh, a lot of the, you know, funding some of these language teams, uh, right? So a lot of the, some of these language teams are, are obviously funded by uh, the Telus Foundation directly. The foundation doesn't, for example, sit down with these language teams and, be, and say things like, you need to do the language this way or something like that. Like the, it's instead just here's the funding and then there's a technical committee that basically checks the progress of these these language projects and says, uh, okay, well, these guys have made progress here, here, and here, um, you know, and then evaluates, you know, basically should these these language projects be continued or, or expanded or shrunk or whatever based on the performance. Now, how you set those kinds of priorities and, and value and evaluate based on those is, is obviously a, the age old political question. Um, but all in all, you know, I, th- I think there's going to be a lot more focus on trying to make some of these things more transparent and obvious as to how the foundation thinks about, uh, you know, the folks at the foundation think about what is important, what is a priority, et cetera. One other thing I'd say, too, is uh, a lot of the foundation decision making processes are really sort of the output of external folks sort of in committees. There's a technical advisory committee. There's folks who also do you know, sort of advise other kinds of tactical deployment from the foundation. But a lot of the, the operations, I'd say, are pretty small. So it's a very small organization. It's not like the, and I think the Ethereum Foundation at its peak had, you know, something like, what, I don't know, 150 people either contracted or employed or whatever. The Health Foundation is, you know, 10 times smaller than that. <laughs> so uh, it, it's, pr- it's pretty small, but it's basically just trying to make sure that things get, uh, they're just trying to fund things and uh, make sure that the, fun- the funding is uh, properly spent. So... Of course, another source of funding is the governance system of the chain itself. Yes. Um, has anyone actually received funding from that yet? Or is that still more like, you know, in theory, people could be, but no one has. So there was a small uh, a small invoice for Athens, the First Amendment proposal. That was about 100 TES, I think. It was just a demonstration. Babylon, I don't recall actually what it was. Maybe it was 1,000. Maybe it was, there was nothing. This current proposal, uh, Cartage, has nothing associated with it because it's a very small fix to a few bugs in, in, in Tezos. This is probably something that's going to happen over the next uh, one year or so, you know, in, in the next year or so. Uh, and a lot of folks are really interested. And you can see this in the, the recent AMA, core development AMA uh, from, I think, last week or the week before that, uh, around how do you do price discovery around these these invoices in a way that's, you know, fair. And that's where I think... So, so Gabriel from uh, from the Lego team, he uh, he published on in this AMA. He basically said he wants to see the you know uh, things like prediction markets that are you know basically evaluating them. You know, you know. I mean, you can kind of do the Ralph if you guys are familiar with the Ralph Merkel mechanism for for example, where you could basically it's a prediction market on 
the satisfaction of people in a year or two years, something like that. And in theory, you can combine uh, things like that with, you know, other kinds of, of uh, mechanisms like Arthur has published on uh, some, uh, you know, in his, I think he has a, a blog post where he talks about if you change staking, for example, to be based on an auction mechanism, you could like basically run a prediction record. I believe it's on like the future of inflation rate uh, rewards um, that uh, people would want from auctioning off of blocks, like, you know, uh, block rights and stuff like that. Trying to build some kind of internal mechanisms around that. So that's still a ways away, I think, that those kinds of price discovery, coming up with like a really robust, like viable price discovery uh, mechanism for invoices is probably going to take a long time. In the short run, and, and I think it's Olaf Carlson Wee from Polychain who's made this point before. So if, say, for example, there's an amendment that, you know, causes Tezos to, you know, become significantly more adopted. Uh, and so say that there's a 50% increase in Tezos, you know, so, so I'm, I'm making I'm making up the metric, but I'm just using it for sake for as a toy example. Say that there's a increase in Tezos smart contract adoption, uh, you know, where 50% more contracts are deployed over the next year or two years or whatever. In theory, like you don't have to provide a, a big relative invoice to the size of the network to fund uh, that, you know, the, the changes that could lead to such a significant increase in adoption. So what I mean by that is actually going back to the point about WhatsApp having only 19 empl- or whatever, tw- 16 employees, but selling for $19 billion or something like this. Like you could have an invoice that funded a team of 20 or 10, or let's say, let's say of even five yeah. people, but maybe we'll use something like zero knowledge or something like, or, or sharding or something like that, where a team of say five, 10 people worked on sharding Tezos that increases, you know, scalability by, you know, I don't know, whatever, let's say, you know, scales by 20 X or something like this, you know, the absolute amount that this invoice could represent could be very large, but the relative amount to the the token holders and the bakers could be quite low. So a half of a percent over that's like in a vesting contract over, you know, say three, four years could turn out to be something that scales the network by 20 X is probably worth you know, sort of a cost like that over four years, you know, spread out across four years, right? And when I say 4%, 0.5%, half a percent, I mean 0.5% of the current uh, tokens now as it, like where you basically, when you do the invoice, those tokens go immediately put into a vesting contract and that inflation is known. It's not like you're minting new tokens or something like that. But, uh, you know, there, there's lots of ways where you can create this really clever incentive models that are really cheap for all the stakeholders, uh, relative to the the market cap or or whatever, but have really significant benefits in terms of adoption or scalability or some metric that you want to choose. Beyond just the funding, what are some of the other learnings that you guys have learned about the governance experimentation that is Tezos now almost reaching up to about two years in? First off, what is different about the current Tezos governance process that was maybe different than what was explained in the white paper? And then what's also different? Has anything changed since the launch of Tezos? So basically, I have a blog post called Amending Tezos. And that blog post is sort of the output of having actually traveled to the nomadic offices in Paris, sat down with the team and said, what is actually in the code base? And let, you know, let's figure out what actually um, you know, the Tezos amendment process is, how to actually make kick this thing off and start using it, right? Basically, you know, went there, we sat down, basically discovered that the way it was implemented was pretty similar to what was in the the white paper. Uh, And so basically what that was, right, is a, you know, there's this four stage process. And then it has this quorum, you know, where at the time where it's basically this mechanism that adjusts based on previous uh, participation in the process. So if say it's 80 percent and then it has an adjustment formula that, you know, if if it was say above 80 percent, that would adjust upward weighting, you know, recent participation uh, by 20% and then using 80%, I think, as its basis, uh, you know, for the rest. But so in practice, then when we went to Athens and other actual uh, amendment processes cycles, this produced dynamic where the, the quorum was expanding, like uh, going up a lot because there was massive participation in terms of stake. So it was something like, you know, 88% or 87% of the stake voted in the for initial, you know, Athens, uh, you know, cycles. That led to an increase of the quorum to something like 81 or 82 percent. So it's just sort of this paradox of the quorum where basically, and this is in the amending Tezos, it was predicted in the amending Tezos article, but basically that you would start to increase the quorum significantly above 80 percent. And then because that's happening, um, because you're increasing it, even though you think that you're like raising the bar for the, you know, the amount of 
consensus that's needed to pass something. In fact, you at some threshold, you actually start to, uh, if, if it's not capped, that you end up giving a lot of power to, say, someone with a 3 or 4% stake to basically come in and just basically veto anything. <laughs> uh, and so you could even get through the initial stages of the process, and then someone could come in uh, with 3% of or 4% of the stake and veto um, you know, the execution of, of one of these amendment proposals. So the change that uh, I think Cryptium Labs wrote is, is similar to what we had worked out in, in, in late 2018, was basically to say, let's put a cap on the quorum and a floor on the quorum. And people are like, well, you know, lowering the quorum, that's going to make it easier to pass things and whales will have more say or whatever. In practice, it actually does the opposite because it means that, you know, a small cartel of folks or even just one large stakeholder can't just like veto everything. Having too high of a level of consensus required to make decisions actually centralizes things. That's like sort of the paradox here. You know, you see it in things like the U.S. Senate. You see it in other places, too, where you just end up basically stasis favors, you know, sort of a lot of times big, big players, right? And so trying to find that sweet spot is really important. And just one more point on that, actually, that I think, you know, is worth mentioning is, so somebody who actually has done a really deep amount of thought on this topic is Matan Field from Dowstack. So a lot of the conversation with him, I think, was really informative in terms of thinking of like long term is our quorums like viable, right? And so uh, basically what he argues is that you know, you end up with a, and he he sort of has his own very generalized framework for evaluating the quality of governance decisions. But basically what he described was like, basically, you want to be able to scale your decisions, you know, be able to handle lots of decisions, but you also want to make sure that they're representative of the larger group. And what you can end up with is with a quorum that is too high to make scalable decisions and too low to be representative of global consensus or whatever. And so that's one of the things we're going to have to think about a lot. And that's where you, you start to, it starts to become interesting to think about alternative uh, mechanisms as well. You know, like, like things like prediction markets and future and stuff. Like things like Brexit, for example. Brexit, like afterwards, you know, you pull people and they're like, we wish we hadn't done Brexit, right? <laughs> uh, in, a lot, in a lot of cases, right? And finding a way to basically have a check on these like low participation or this sort of thing is definitely something that's worth exploring um, you know, I think in the future, but I have, we haven't yet like fully thought out like how you solve that problem. Maybe, I don't know if you guys in Cosmos have, have thought about like any solutions to, I know you guys have a differently designed quorum system than ours. I think it's like 51%. Is that right? We just have a fix saying that like, you know, it's 51% to pass a proposal, then one third can veto. And there needs to be at least 40% of stake voting for, but otherwise it gets automatically rejected. Relating to that point, you know, what are we doing in Cosmos and whatnot is Tezos was really, you know, originally one of the main value propositions was it is going to be like the governance focused like chain. But today, when we see is almost all the new chains that are launching are uh, usually have some form of strong on chain governance. So whether it's Cosmos or Polkadot or even some of the newer chains. So how does Tezos kind of position itself in the market now in a way you could you could say that tezos succeeded in a way where it yeah. kind of convinced the rest of the blockchain ecosystem that hey on-chain governance is maybe a good idea but now given that what's the future of tezos what's the new market positioning so i actually would push back and say it's easy to say that you're going to do on-chain governance uh, you don't really need on-chain governance unless you're trying to do something useful there are certain chains out there, and I'm not going to name them, that love to talk about governance as the only thing that they do. I think those are probably all bound for irrelevance, to be frank. And I think that you only really need governance when you have something to govern. So Tezos ultimately, regardless of the governance process, is aiming to be a currency and a, and a you know, as a project was sort of founded to be, to be a currency and a, a smart contracts platform, right? The governance process is really only useful insofar as it's in service of those kinds of goals. Um, and so I feel like the larger question we should be asking is, why does Tezos build a really robust social consensus? Like, why does it build the kind of moat that somebody like an Ethereum or, or Bitcoin has? Like, how does it get to that point? Realistically, if you can make lots of decisions really quickly, like you're probably not, uh, you know, in most cases, you're not a really particularly interesting chain probably to begin with, because you don't have any, you know, people using the platform who want to like, veto your changes or you don't have any like I'm, I'm just saying this is a heuristic you can you can use to think about this and 
I don't know, who do you particularly have in mind? Because I can say how I would position Tezos versus some of these different projects if you're... Polkadot or Cosmos or... So Polkadot is sort of... Well, actually, I'll use Cosmos instead because I think Cosmos and Tezos sort of follow the opposite vision. So Tezos is like, network effects probably accrue to one chain. Basically, we want to figure out how to have the most network effects of any chain. And we're going to do that like a priori, like before, before thinking of like the practical considerations of does anyone want to build on the thing or whatever. And then Cosmos' thing is, you know, sort of more of like, there's just certain limitations that as you try to scale socially, you just cannot get over. And so you might as well have a pretty open architecture in terms of, you know, allowing people to spin up chains. And then we're going to put all the effort into making all these different sovereign zones talk to each other. I mean, I'm over, I'm exaggerating, but it depends on what you want to be, right? Uh, When you grow up. So uh, if you're a chain that wants to be, um, to be money and to, to be, uh, you know, sort of acquire a lot of network effects, sort of following the Ethereum or Bitcoin model, then Tezos is, I think, actually decently positioned to that as sort of the, it has, you know, a lot of social consensus also around that have emerged from people onboarding to do staking. So like, even though staking is like, we're surprised at how interested everyone is in it. You know, there's sort of this sense of participation and direct engagement with the network that is accessible to anyone in the world around one chain. That, you know, that kind of resembles, you know, sort of how a lot of people coalesce around things like Bitcoin and, and Ethereum and whatnot. Whereas other chains like Cosmos and, and Polkadot are really more about like sort of running in the background, in my opinion. So like I think Cosmos is like sort of the, the I mean, how many people who ever use anything that will be built on Cosmos ever like think about are ever going to have to think about Cosmos? And hopefully that's true for a lot of, uh, you know, most things that are built on Tezos as well. But uh, in practice, sort of think that that's the difference in consciousness around these chains is, you know, do you want to be a chain that is like populist and like lots of people coalesce around and, and like lots of people care about, uh, et cetera, or, you know, and people want to participate in, or do you want to be a chain that where people just build things on top of it, it runs very much in, in the background. Uh, and, and thus you want to focus on having some kind of architecture that is, you know, going to onboard as many different potentially conflicting folks as possible. That's a good uh, note to end on, I think, is, you know, what will Tezos become as it grows up? Yeah. <laughs> and so it's definitely an interesting ecosystem. And thanks for sharing your thoughts on, you know, how the Tezos ecosystem is evolving. And we'll definitely keep following it as it continues to grow. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.